Hello, my name is Jordan Lloyd Bookie from Zubin, and apologies for the little delay at our end. We are having some technical difficulties, um, but and you might notice them during the course of this hangout. But it seems like our sound is going well. It's just that our guest might come in and out of some rainbow lines here, so excuse those. But the most important part, um, besides your beautiful face, Madeline, is obviously the the content of our talk, and so that won't be impacted. And welcome. So uh, why don't we just get started by uh, hearing a little bit about you. Obviously, you're the CEO of the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media. Uh, we'd love to hear just a little bit about your path and, uh, and your role at the Institute. Um, well, my, my path is essentially I've spent about 30 years in the entertainment industry. And like many of us, I always had a parallel track in nonprofit. I always volunteered and I've sat on a lot of boards and I had an epiphany, a personal epiphany uh, because two things happened to me which um, gave me pause and made me examine uh, my journey. Uh, the first is that I was running a company, a digital company and when I stepped into the company after a year I realized that they didn't have the right operating capital and um, what looked good on paper wasn't good in, in reality. And at the same time, one of my best friends died very unexpectedly. And she was very unhappy in her job. She'd wanted to make a career change. And the combination of those two things happening at the same time made me think and gave me an epiphany and said, what if I don't live long, long enough to have this you know this vision, this life that I thought I would have, because I always wanted to run a nonprofit, and I've loved the entertainment industry since I was a child. And to make a long story short, uh, Gina was also looking to take the institute to the next level, and she found me, and we came together almost five years ago, and uh, and have formed a, a great great partnership. Yeah, I think, um, well, why don't you tell us a little bit about the Institute and the mission and vision um, for that you and Gina Davis have, have? Well, this, the Institute resulted out of a very personal experience for Gina as well, and considering she's been a, a very well-known and uh, has won lots of awards for her acting, uh, being an actor in Hollywood, being an actor over the age of 41 in Hollywood, clearly uh, she knew uh, intimately how difficult it is and how rare female roles are for adults. But what struck her was when she was watching programming with her young daughter, who at the time was two years old, and she'd have her daughter sitting in her lap and she'd watch kids' movies and videos and all kinds of great programming, and she noticed that there was a dearth of female characters. And she would start counting the characters behind her daughter's head. Hmm. And when she asked her friends if they noticed there were so few female characters, they'd say, no, I didn't really notice that. And when she'd go on meetings with producers and content creators, they'd say the same thing. So it made her realize that people weren't seeing. And a lot of it has to do with unconscious bias. It's the same reason why orchestras who wanted to have a gender balanced uh, set of musicians had to actually remove the shoes of the women who were auditioning even though they did blind auditions because if people heard the sound of the clicking heels the unconscious bias kicked in. So we all have unconscious bias and there's a lot of unconscious gender bias that is just baked in. We just don't see it. But she clearly saw it and decided to take action. And that's how the Institute came to be. And uh, what she decided to do is to get the data, the research, to know whether her observations were in fact true. Um, and they are. And to this day, there's still a lot of gender uh, inequity in children's programming and most of the programming that we watch in terms of film um, and television. So that's a great overview, and um, that is definitely what I found most compelling. So backstory is that Madeline and I met when I was working at Google in K-12, and we were really com it was such compelling 
data. And I think for you're not used to seeing a, a nonprofit, especially in the entertainment industry, right, that's so driven by research and data. And everything is sort of motivated by that. And it's it's very moving when you when you see the, the numbers. And I wanted to hear from your perspective, you do a number of reports, and people should definitely check them out. It's an easy URL, it's just cjane.org, uh, as in S-E-E, -E, Jane. Uh, or what are some of the statistics and you know pieces of data that you have come across over the years or more recently that surprised you the most? Well, there's a lot of people who are kind of jumping in and doing studies. Uh, our methodology looks at speaking characters. So what we look at is how many characters utter one word or more. Not everybody out there doing this kind of research is um, doing it as, I'd say, intensely as we are. And our research has been done by a wonderful uh, researcher, Dr. Stacy Smith at USC Annenberg, and um, and so she will code and count every single speaking character. So that that she's literally what is her methodology to with students or what have you yeah. to actually be watching films and counting? Yes, wow. and watching them over and over and over again. Very very rigorous standards and some of the highest academic standards you can imagine. So with that said, when we recently looked across family films and primetime television and children's television, we were looking, she was looking at almost 12,000 speaking characters. And wow. what we saw is that to this day, this gender inequality is still, is still there. And uh, in terms of primetime television, they tend to do a better job uh, but essentially, a th you only have a third of the speaking characters that are that are female. Um, and some of the other things we notice is is what we call hypersexuality, and what it means is that, in layman terms, that female characters for the most part are serve as eye candy. Mm. Um, they're either very very skinny, and we've noticed in children's television that 37 percent of the characters are very very skinny. Why? Would you have that uh, in, in, in children's programming? Why would there be any partial nudity across family films or children's programming you know, or prime time? And then when we looked into careers, uh, we noticed particularly in family films, we really didn't show uh, women in the highest echelon of executive power in terms of politics. And this is still in, uh, kids, in kids' programs? Yeah, and, and in kids' programs, for the most part, they don't even show a lot of jobs, right. uh, nonetheless. And so we're showing both boys and girls um, a world that is bereft of female presence, but also uh, the female characters don't really have um, a purpose beyond being objectified. Okay, so... Presume, and I should mention that if anybody has a question or wants to ask, you can see in the Hangout right now, you can actually just type in a question and we'll see it and Madeline will answer. Um, so please do that. Uh, okay, so presumably some of the directors, producers, I know that they're, they're they might be majority men, but many of them must have you know daughters and family members and just a sense that that's not fair. So what do they say when they're presented? Tell us, like, what happens? So you have this data that's showing you that the girls are scantily clad, their, you know, their wrists are probably the same size as their waist, I don't know, whatever your sort of, your, all these the data points you're finding out, they're not as well represented, and you go to a studio and you have a meeting, and you're there with Gina, and, and what happens? For the most part, everyone is shocked, and mm. What they're particularly shocked over is when we talk about the entire universe of the film or of the TV show. So they, in many cases, they think because they may have one really strong female character that they did their job. And that gets back to unconscious bias. Um, and them not realizing that women are... 51% of the population, why wouldn't that raise a red flag 
if they were developing uh, a movie or a TV show, and it wasn't period or historical where even the background wasn't balanced with male and females. And what we've noticed is not only do we have few female protagonists, but when we look at the backgrounds, it's about a five to one ratio of male to female characters. And so the, the consciousness that we try to raise is look at the script uh, and, and, and look at even down to the extras. And just either say in the script, make it 50% female, but really think about the entire world, fictitious world of the movie and TV show versus just the leads. And of course, we would love to see better parody when it comes to leads. And for if you think about being authentic as a content creator, and if the industry is dominated, a male-dominated industry, which it is, in family films, it's about a five-to-one ratio, and they write what they know, then from, from that standpoint, you can see where there'd be so few female characters. So one way to improve that is to get more females in the pipeline in decision-making roles. And what we did see in our 2012 report is that when there was a presence of a female writer, script writer, there was a 10% increase in on-screen roles. Wow. So, so solving the problem behind the screen will also solve the problem on screen as well. And so that's one, one solution that you're helping with, right, is helping to try and build that pipeline. What are you seeing from the meetings that you're having with the folks who are there now? Have you, can you point to, you know, wins that you say this is, you know, you kind of feel responsible for it, or is it like a slow change over time that we're going to feel, or do you see anything you say, yeah, that's like immediate impact that I can see in, more tangibly? Um, many of the numbers are aggregate, so it may look like there's not been significant change, but we definitely know that there's movement. We have been told for a fact by some male directors, you know, female producers, they've told us specific examples. Um, there was a very large animated film that came out last summer that the director said, I remember when you were here a year ago, and I made sure that my movie was 50% female characters, and he absolutely did. Wait, now I have to know what movie that was. What movie? My, uh, yeah, unfortunately, we're not at liberty to say. Okay, I'm not going to go through them, I guess. I, mean, I guess we could probably figure it out if we wanted to. Yeah, there was another uh, movie, and the producer said, my goodness, we're so far down the road in the animation. Maybe we can double and triple up on a certain character that we had, a background character that was female, and they did that. And now they're looking, you know, forward. Um, we actually did an impact study to capture this type of feedback and what what we asked is, we know you're going to use the data, we know you're going to share it internally with your colleagues, but what have you changed as a result of hearing Gina speak or hearing her presentation? And 68% said that they changed two or more projects and 41% said they changed four more projects. And when we said, well, what did you do? They said, we gave a female character a job. We took some non-speaking characters, gave them some dialogue. Uh, we hired some more female crew. We made them less sexualized. And so these are the things that they were changing. So we believe when we do the study, you know, again in 2015, We'll see the needle move for the first time in probably four, four decades. Um, however, as we start to look at studio by studio, we believe that there may be more progress there than when you look at the aggregate um, in terms of the entire industry, and that's something that um, we're paying very close close attention to. Probably good to do that more granularly, right, so you can like create a sense of competition or what happens, sort or of like this is... You know, they've done better. I mean, you, you, you would have a little bit of a ransom, I guess. Um, so we have a question from Monica Oliveira, who is writing, and I think you spoke to this a little, but maybe um, just, you know, bringing it up again. She asked, do female characters and producers also contribute to this? And I'm assuming that this means 
you said that the screenwriters certainly write in 10% more. If it's a female screenwriter, they're likely to write in 10% more female characters. What about directors and producers? She says, I know there aren't many of them, but I'd love to know if they're, they are also likely to feature more female characters, or I don't know what the relationship is between a director and a producer, but, or sorry, a director and a, a screenwriter, but are they likely to say, hey, I, you know, ask for some changes if it's a female, is it, is it you know, kind of an added layer? What yes. are directors and producers yes. with their yes, role? Yes, definitely. Just by nature of their, what's authentic to them, um, clearly, unless they're working on a historical piece, um, absolutely, there's a more likelihood of of having more on-screen, you know, characters. Um, and okay, so actually, I I uh, recognize this picture of Monica and know her, and one she works. She's a works closely with PBS, which is kind of a, a lead in here to ask you about PBS. I I I. Feel like from watching it, you know, I'm not counting characters, but from watching with my kids, I tend to feel you know, better about having them watch some of those shows. I, it seems like they're you know diverse and have girl characters, what have you. Would, would a company or would a would a organization like PBS be able to have the like cast of characters that they have if they weren't PBS, if they weren't publicly funded, if they if they weren't you know working from a nonprofit status, like, do you think that that is what allows PBS to really stand out from, from others? I hope this isn't too, you know, political of a... No, well, first of all, um, preschool, preschool channels and preschool programming is almost at parity. Um, and why, why is that, ver and then why does it change? We, why it changes when kids hit six or seven, we don't know. We really don't know, but in terms of preschool programming, it's pretty much so, you know, at parity. And it's when you hit that six, that six-year-old demographic that things, you know, dramatically change. Um, PBS Kids has some amazing shows. They have Peg Plus Cat. Mm -hmm. um, so does Disney Junior. They have Doc McStuffin. So there's some amazing, amazing um, Psy Girls. There's just wonderful, some wonderful programming. Um, you know, PBS... Um, has women and girls lead, which they're, they're I believe they're the only uh, television entity that has made a three-year commitment to showcasing the stories of women um, in such an intense way. Um, uh, we haven't done an analysis of that, but um, clearly, when you look at you know Pat Harrison, who's the head of CPB, um, and you look at some of the other you know, networks that may or may not be led by women. Um, clearly, that has um, an influence. Uh, PBS has a lot of female executives. Um, uh, you know, so I think if you look at who's driving the content and who's making the green light, uh, and if you look at where there are women, you know, present, I think you may see uh, more programming. Uh, there are more women leading... Um, in leading positions, executive positions in television than there are in film. Maybe that's why the numbers, you know, are better. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, there's a lot of different touch points that, that you know, you can look at. Um, but TV overall does a better job than film, family film. And what do you think... Okay, so for parents who might be watching and thinking, okay, well... This is, there might be some shorter, t one, one option is just to watch t <laughs> just TV, no film, right, or just like handpick your films. Um, another option would, what are some ways that we can be a part of the change? So what are ways you can support your work? You know, what are the things that people can do on an individual or even as like a community or school, preschool even basis to, you know, to help make uh, changes or help make sure that, you know, Consumers' voices are heard, right? I think that it seems like the six, seven-year-olds, they're probably the producers and directors, what have you, must think that they're making something that that audience wants and that their parents want, right? But if, if I, my guess is that if there was a loud enough voice, um, that wouldn't necessarily be the case, or what do you think? Um, well, there were a few questions there. So, you know, what can parents do in their own home with their own children 
and I think wherever and whenever you can watch what your children are watching particularly if your children are a little bit older uh, don't let them run wild on the laptop pay attention to what your children are watching on the internet as well a lot of parents think that oh I can trust my kid and honestly you'd be shocked at what they're seeing so uh, so that's one thing and watch what you're gonna watch with them it's just you know when it comes to a particular animated movie or a TV show uh, look at the characters and if there are female characters that are objectified or don't really have a role the parent can say hey do you think a girl could have been the baseball player do you think that girl could have been the scientist do you think and have a dialogue and 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 listen to what your children say uh, there's a series that we did a children's educational video series which we'd love for uh, your viewers to check out called guess who and we would ask children what does a mathematician look like and what does a baker look like boys and girls what does a pilot look like what does a race car driver look like and their default was always male and when it was revealed because these were real people yeah. uh, a real mayor a real judge a real baker a real uh, I love the baker mathematician baker. that's a great one mm -hmm. they were um, the kids were flabbergasted and this is the 21st century yeah. so you as a parent may be kind of shocked the kind of stereotypes that your children are picking up and so there's an opportunity to have you know a discussion with them and make them conscious because when children are really really little they don't have a filter they're just taking in all this all this media uh, and they're engaging with media upwards of seven hours a day if you look at uh, multitasking uh, on multiple devices and our friends at Common Sense Media a few months ago released a study that two-year-olds are spending 15 minutes a day on smartphones so there's a lot that parents can do to um, maybe not control everything that they're watching hopefully they are but also have a dialogue um, in terms of having a uh, an, uh, being an advocate clearly everyone can be a citizen journalist you know parents have Facebook pages parents are involved in the PTA parents are um, a lot of parents are, are blogging and clearly they have an opportunity to voice their opinions um, all the content creators um, pay very close attention to uh, what consumers you know may post in terms of helping us you know clearly um, anyone who looks at our research or looks at our educational materials and can spread the word you know is fantastic of course we're a nonprofit so we welcome any donation no donation is too large um, but there's a lot there's a lot that, that you know they can do and um, if they want to get involved with us we rely really really heavily um, on volunteers that are all over kind of all over the world so um, so in terms of just us specifically beyond what they can do in their community um, at, or at home there's a lot that they can do that's great and and again definitely your website cjane.org I'm sure when, when opportunities arise or if you sign up for the uh, newsletter I know personally that, that you know there's oftentimes like an, an sort of simple call to action you know there's there's a variety of ways to get involved that are that you nicely list out there pretty regularly we have one another question so I want to take this this is from Chaz who says everything you're saying uh, about the lack of representation of young women in film and TV is magnified when it comes to women over 40 and that's what you referenced at the very beginning which was obviously Gina Davis's experience uh, do you think it's important for young women to see more positive representations of older women on film and is your is the Institute you know specifically focused on this or do you also sort of play a role in thinking about women and older women in film and that also being important for young kids um, couldn't agree more uh, with with the um, with your listener with the, with your viewer um, there is severe ageism you know in Hollywood and essentially when theme, when actors um, hit 41 they kind of fall off it fall off the planet um, and and it was interesting uh, you know when you think about you know our stereotypes of older women and this works for men as well I have a colleague uh, a friend of mine who 
likes to do a test, and when she's with people, she'll say, um, "I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to say a word, and you have to tell me what's the first thing that comes into your head." And she'll say, "Grandma." And of course, no matter how old the person is, the image that comes into their head is the little old granny with the gray hairs and the and the and the and the glasses. And 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 when you think about it, you know, I have friends who are uh, not gray yet and and have grandchildren so it's something as simple as that uh, that reinforces that that stereotype yeah and I, I think my, my guess is that the work that you're doing you know in, in general if you're if you're focusing on like family films those films oftentimes feature somebody who's over 42 right so you're so you are actually addressing in those films not just the, not just the kids who are you know playing different roles, but also you know the entire the entirety of the cast, right? Exactly. But um, but obviously extends to films beyond family films, as we all we all know. If I don't have to worry about that, you know, I'm only 25, so <laughs> <laughs> not quite. I might I think my days might be numbered for my chance at stardom. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so Madeline, it doesn't look like we have any other questions from the audience. Um, I guess I just want to see if you have anything, uh, you know, words of wisdom, final things you want us to impart or think about or or do as we leave this um, as we leave this conversation. It, for me, I'm I'm really you know, intrigued, I guess, by the by the research, and I'm looking forward to seeing the impact you've made. I don't know if it had anything to do with Frozen, but I look at that movie and I know there must be you know, probably a whole host of things around the girls, you know, bodies and all that that might not be perfect, but seeing my little four-year-old sing, you know, sing Let It Go and get excited about it and be completely you know, unaware that they're princesses, et cetera, and, and be so excited about it shows it's such a great example of this huge phenomenon and uh, I don't know, I, I can see the, you know, the work sort of trickling down at a very popular mass level. Oh, one more question, sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, but, then, but then think about what you want to leave us with for your parting words. Um, okay. Have you seen any trends regarding, Taylor asked, have you seen any trends regarding female roles in independent films that differ from maybe major studio productions? Absolutely. So we're very, very close with the Women of Sundance and the Sundance Institute. And they've, and it's actually our professor who has done some wonderful studies for them that's looking at women in documentaries. And wow. women in documentaries um, are doing much better in terms of being able to be the content creator, the writer, director. Um, so, so independent films, you know, documentaries um, are definitely doing a, a better job. Uh, and um, and there's definitely some wonderful studies that they've done uh, that that looks into it that looks into that. So yes, I I would agree with that with that statement. And in terms of parting words, um, um, I'll I'll give you an example. I mean, everyone can use a gender lens in terms of uh, things that they may be doing. Hiring decisions, um, business decisions, I'll, and I'll give you an example. I was giving a keynote in Indianapolis, and there was a woman who was a regional director for a major financial services firm, and she said, "We're having a problem recruiting women to the retail side of our business. Why do you think that is?" And I said, "Well, when you go home tonight." Ask yourself a few questions. One, how are you recruiting? Are you using the internet? Are you using a company website? What does it look like? What are the images? Um, you, your, your listeners may have heard about the Getty Images project that uh, Sheryl Sandberg and her Lean In team are working on in terms of changing how females are portrayed in stock photography that winds up in advertising. So how do you show more women as scientists? How do you show more women in, in, in non-traditional, non-stereotypical roles? Uh, which we think it's a wonderful, wonderful effort. So as a person that 
may be in charge of, of messaging or advertising or marketing, you know, look at your company. How are they marketing, you know, to women, whether they're trying to hire them or advertise to them. And also, in the case of this particular company, I asked her to look at the, the job description, you know, how is it written. Uh, women tend to check off every single job requirement in, before uh, applying. And to make a long story short, she went home that night and emailed me and said, oh my goodness, I'm working with IT, we don't have any pictures of women in any of our messaging and, and etc. So sometimes it's, a, it's the little things. And I think everybody can, can, can look at that in terms of their own life. You know, one thing I think for parents to think about, you know, certainly obviously we work with apps or books or something that you talk a lot about, or I've seen you talk about a lot in the past is, you know, does a character have to be a male? Would it be easy just to flip this character to be a female, right? And in the case of, you know, reading a book, with my, which might even just have animals, or many times little kids, it's not really obvious necessarily, right, what gender a child is, or this is the same for apps that you're, especially sort of storybook apps, right? But in general, when you're speaking or just even talking with your kid, think about the gender that you are ascribing to an animal, right? I noticed with myself, and I'm so conscious about it, but I noticed it all, I was just oftentimes referring to animals as being, you know, look at that squirrel. Do you think he's hungry? Right? Why, why is it a he, right? And it's because there's obviously many societal reasons, but the point being very small things, but can we start to just shift in those small ways? There's a hiring example. There's like you know, bedtime uh, with your kids. There's just being out in the world and talking, right? And so it's some things we can't change, but other things we can, and it's actually not so hard. And what I love, especially about what you said earlier, is about watching media with your kids is, you know, you can help infuse the meaning. You can help ascribe meaning to what a child's watching. So maybe it's not perfect, but if you're there to have that positive parenting role and to talk about it, then you can sort of shift it, shift what happens. So maybe the girl's not a scientist, but if you talk about could she be, like you said, you might end up with a much more, you know, positive image and helping, you know, shift your child's perspective. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. It's a really a pleasure to see you again <laughs> and a treat. And I hope that everybody uh, checks out cjane.org again. Uh, we're Zubin, and we'll be writing up a, a post of some of our lessons learned here and, and hope that you're able to support uh, support the, the mission of the Institute in whatever ways that you can. And thank you so much, Madeline. Well, we're so thrilled with Zubin and what you're doing as well. So we just wish you lots and lots of success. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Have a Take good care. night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.